We're going to go ahead and start the recording, I think. Yep. Oh, somebody already did it. I guess that was Mike. Yep. Welcome to tonight's virtual Civil War presentation brought to you by CivilWarTalk.com. Thanks for joining us. Tonight's guest is John V. Corstein discussing his book, The Monitor Boys, The Crew of the Union's First Ironclad, and The Sinking of the USS Monitor, which occurred 158 years ago tomorrow. The series is provided by CivilWarTalk.com, the American Civil War Discussion Forum. We're pleased to be able to bring these authors and programs to you via the live virtual platform and appreciate you all joining us. If you aren't already a member of Civil War Talk, I'd encourage you to go ahead and become a member. We'll be providing the information for membership um, later on in the program, and I hope everyone who's with us tonight will become a part of the Civil War Talk community. Our guest tonight is John V. Korstein. Mr. Korstein is an award-winning historian, preservationist, and author. He is Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. The author of 19 books, his The Monitor Boys, The Crew of the Union's First Ironclad, won the 2012 Henry Adams Prize for Excellence in Historical Literature. If you want to avoid Oops, I'm on the wrong page here. Um, Korstein has produced, narrated, and written six PBS documentaries, including the Silver Telly Award series, The Civil War in Hampton Roads. He is the recipient of the 1996 President's Award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Korstein lives in the National Register of Historic Places property, the 1757 Herbert House. This outstanding example of brick Georgian architecture is located near Blackbeard's Point on the Hampton River in Hampton, Virginia. Tonight, Mr. Korstein's presentation will focus on his book, The Monitor Boys, the crew of the Union's first ironclad and the sinking of USS Monitor, which occurred 158 years ago tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming John V. Korstein. Well, hello everyone and uh, happy holidays to you, I guess at first. Uh, of course, I wanna tell you that right now uh, in Virginia, it's quarter till nine. And I'm gonna tell you the monitor is floundering off of Cape Hatteras, 90 miles away at this very moment. If we stay on till 1230, uh, we will be when it sinks. Uh, tomorrow morning, but I don't know if we're going to do that. But anyway, once again, uh, I'm John Korstein. I'm uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center. I just want to make one correction. I just published a book yesterday, so I'm now at 20. Uh, so what can I say? Huzzah. Well, our story today um, is going to be part taken partially from my book, The Monitor Boys, but it is really about the last days of the Monitor. You see, the Monitor, of course, had laurels spread all around her as a result of the great victory, or presumed victory, actually, the two ironclads fought to a draw during the March 9, 1862 Battle of Hampton Roads. And the ship went on to serve throughout 1862, uh, fought at the Battle of Drury's Bluff on May 15, 1862. It then supported McClellan's campaign. It came back down to Hampton Roads uh, by September. They were worried that the Confederate ironclad, the CSS Richmond, would come down and attack Hampton Roads. But I have to tell you, it wasn't finished yet. So by October, the, the Monitor needed repairs. Consequently, they'll go up to the Washington Navy Yard, have a bottom scrape, some improvements done, and then back down to Hampton Roads in late October 1862. Slide, please. And uh, uh, so we have um, a pretty amazing, oh, let's go to the next one, please. Um, yes, can we enlarge that for a second? We're going to be talking about a lot of people seen in this very picture, okay? We're going to hear their voices because I'm going to use quotes from them. Uh, the man I talk mostly about is fourth one standing. He's third from the left. His name is William Keeler. 
He is acting assistant paymaster, William Keeler. Um, then we go down to the second line and to the left is Samuel Dana Green, who also is going to be talking. And then next to him, uh, to the right of him, is going to be Louis Napoleon Stoddard, a master mate. And, and he's going to do some exciting things. I got some quotes from him. Sadly, on the first line, the two guys sitting down, the one on the left, uh, Robinson Hands, will go down with the ship. Uh, the one next to him, Albert Campbell, guess what? He breaks his leg in the engine room right before the monitor leaves, and he's going to have to be replaced. So he misses these tremendous events. Slide, please. Um, so we all know that the monitor uh, was a most unique vessel. Uh, I'm going to have to tell you right now, some of the things we'll talk about today are based on her own design because uh, she's made in three parts. Slide, please. And these three parts are going to be, there you can see her in the water. Uh, I'll tell you, they all complain. Like William Keeler is sitting in his, what he called his snuggery, his quarters, reading um, in Hampton Roads. And all of a sudden, waves, the, the, he has deck lights and the sun brings in. And all of a sudden it goes dark in his cabin and he looks up and he can see fish. So, you know, you are virtually in a submarine. Everybody lives below the uh, armored deck. So the monitor is built in three parts. The turret, uh, which actually weighs 121 pounds. It's got two nine inch dog, or 121 tons, excuse me. And uh, the two dog each weigh eight tons. So that's very top heavy. It's centered nicely. And then there's an armored deck, but below that armored deck slide, please, is going to be uh, problems. And you can see, now look at the picture off to the right, and that just shows the tower. And notice the armored deck overhang over the hull. That's not gonna work well in heavy seas. So the ship is built turret, armored deck, and then a one inch iron boiler plate hull is going to be connected to the armored deck with oh, two rows of, of bolts. That's it. So that's a, that, that, that makes for a not a happy vessel uh, when in a storm. So anyway, slide please. Um, the great thing is, is that the monitor, uh, this is William Keeler again, so actually, let's start with Christmas Day. Ah, it's a glorious day in Hampton Roads, about 55 degrees, very clear. However, the celebrations start early in the morning. The USS Colorado and Fort Monroe will do target practice. Then the uh, USS Colorado will do target practice with the HMS Ardeen. Now firing off the guns, oh, that's so much fun. You know, it's celebrations like fireworks. That's what they used to do during uh, the you know, 19th century, during Christmas. And William Keeler is going to say, the smoke was so heavy that you could not see 50 feet beyond you. And that when shots came, they came like bolts of lightning flashing within the clouds. Oh my gosh, William Keeler actually has four different meals that day. He, uh, you know, he's, he's the paymaster, so he interfaces with a lot of people on the shore. So he goes to the Kimberly Hotel on Old Point Comfort, has a great meal. He then goes to the commanding general's house. By this time, it's John Adams Dix, uh, major general, and they'll have a good time there. Uh, then he goes on to the Colorado. He gets more food there. Then by the time he gets on the monitor, which uh, Lewis, uh, Napoleon Stoddard, had gathered all this great food that all he could do was eat a couple of nuts and an orange. So, uh, you know, that's what people thought of the monitor boys. They thought, oh my gosh, 
these people are heroes and they are going to great, make greater things for the union. Well, actually, let's talk about the people below the deck, right? Um, and the seamen themselves, you know, you have eight messmates uh, on the monitor. And uh, so those messmates um, would give the cook an extra dollar to make um, their dinner, their Christmas dinner. So the biggest thing is, is that uh, George Gear, um, who has to work most of the day, um, well, he will say, it's the, it was the worst meal he ever had. The cook ruined it. However, um, Seaman uh, Jacob Nicholas is going to say it was the greatest meal he had ever had. Uh, uh, so, you know, basically uh, he is going to talk about um, when uh, he eats, he is going to, uh, as usual, uh, I'm going to get this quote in just a second. Um, basically, um, he will say, Jacob Nicholas, the meal, we had chicken stew and then stuffed turkey, mashed potatoes and soft bread. After this, we had plum pudding and some nice fruitcake with apples for dessert. Well, that's much different than Gear said. And I don't think Nicholas had a good palate because he said fruitcake was good. And I've never found that. Well, what's going to happen is the monitor is badly needed and badly needed to actually serve in what is known as Gideon Wells' effort because he wants to have a combine operation to capture Wilmington. The union has made all these other monitors, the Basaic class, which are improved monitors, better blower system, 15-inch gun, uh, better pilot house on top of the turret, head, turret top. Everything's kind of neat about those guns. They're, they're even bigger. So what Wells wants to do is send all these monitors down to Beaufort, North Carolina, and then with Major General John Gray Foster have a joint expedition to capture Wilmington. He thought he could sneak the monitors behind Fort Caswell and Fort Fisher at the entrance to Cape Fear River. Well, you know what? He was a little wrong because the old inlet, which was the deepest of them all, had to, at high tide, could take 11 foot drafts. The monitor was 10 foot 0.6 feet. However, the Basaic class were all 11.6. So that plan was terrible and Gideon Wells didn't even know it. So, you know, nevertheless, they're talking about it. And so basically um, what we're gonna see is that on Christmas day, John Pine Bankhead, his father was Brigadier General James Bankhead, best friends of Winfield Scott. His cousin was Major General John Bankhead Magruder. Uh, so, you know, this guy is um, you know, upper class, excellent officer, a gentleman in all re reports. Well, so he'll read, he'll muster the crew together uh, in the berth deck, which is right below the turret, and say, you know, today uh, we are going, we have orders to go to Beaufort, North Carolina. You can imagine the crew going, oh my gosh. Samuel Dana Green actually says, this is not an ocean going ship. We do not have the steam power to go against a headwind or a sea and would not steer even smooth weather. Going so does not mind her helm readily. Well, I tell you, rumors of the monitor's last voyage down from New York to Hampton Roads had all the old salts worried. And yet Jacob Nicholas rode his father saying, oh, we're headed south and uh, everyone's afraid that we have to go around Cape Hatteras. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's what he writes. I don't think he had my accent, but uh, I'm going to tell you right now that uh, I think we'll be just fine. Now on the 26th, they're supposed to leave. They're supposed to leave under tow of a 20, 236 foot long paddle wheeler, side wheeler, the Rhode Island. 
unfortunately commanded by one of the greatest rescue at sea officers in the world at the time. His daring rescue of the British bark Adele off of Cape Ann, Massachusetts will prompt Queen Victoria to give him a gold presentation sword for his heroism. However, he couldn't accept it. He had to go ask Congress because of the monuments clause. I know we forget about that sometimes, but nevertheless, um, you know, he's got, and they say, here, you can have it. Um, so that's good. So, however, a terrible storm comes through Hampton Roads. And so they can't leave. In fact, because of their delays, they are thinking, man, we might have a chance to see one of those monitors coming down from New York, particularly the Montauk, which is commanded by their former commander, Commander John Lomer Worden. However, they're like passing ships on the 29th of December. At two o'clock, the monitor will pick up its toe and head around Cape Henry in perfect weather. Um, and Keeler will actually say, uh, once the, the weather became clear and present with every prospect of the weather continuing for the trip to Beaufort. Well, that's going to change a little bit when they wake up. On the morning of the 30th, they notice clouds off to the southwest, right? And a little bit of swell. But there are no worries. Bankhead contacts the engine room. Builds pumps are taking care of everything. So it's getting a little rough. And in fact, in the afternoon, it begins to rain, pelting sleet, snow, freezing rain snow, you name the bad stuff that can come down, it's coming down on the monitor. And the waves are starting to increase. But it doesn't matter, because um, I got to tell you that the officers all sit down to dinner at five o'clock in the afternoon. Here's a storm raging above them. And they take no notice, telling jokes, laughing. In fact, William Keeler will say, we knew we were headed to gain greater laurels for our ship. That's what they all wanted. Now, I, I got to tell you, before darkness, Bankhead will have a chalk message that says, if we become in trouble, we will raise our red lantern and send flares. And he'd already told him that, but he wanted to make sure because the waves by, you know, darkness are starting to increase. In fact, they increase in great magnitude. And so as they pass Cape Hatteras, the storm increased in such a major way. Now, Bankhead, um, as he recorded, towards the evening, the swell somewhat decreased. The bilge pumps were being found simply sufficient to keep her clear of water that penetrated through the side holes of the pilot house, the hawse hole, and the base of the tower. Slide, please. I got to tell you, what they had done to get the ship, this is John Pine Bankhead. I'll take another slide, please. Great sideburns. Um, now, ah, this is the wardroom like they are sitting down for dinner. Can you believe this? Storm overhead. They don't care. But the water after their meal is starting to leak. Now, they had jacked up the turret against the advice of the monitor's designer, John, um, John Erickson. And, and so they put caulking around it, covered by tar and red putty. They had covered all the side holes, but the force of the sea was seething and foaming as it ran across the deck by seven o'clock, knocking all those oakum and red putty away. So the ship was starting to sink. And when the water comes down through the ring of the turret, it's going right into guess where? The birth deck. So everybody's getting wet. Um, they're starting to notice that as darkness really shrouds the scene, that the storm increases in ferocity. The waves danced and broke and dashed against, uh, with such tremendous force against our tower. 
Bankhead said, we found the vessel towed badly, yawning very much, and with the increased motion, making somewhat more water around the base of the tower. He ordered the engineers to put on the Worthington pumps and the bilge injection because the water was starting to rise, but those pumps keep it going fairly well. However, within 45 minutes, the ironclad was in very heavy weather, riding one huge wave, plunging through the next, and that's shooting straight to the bottom of the ocean. That is right. You know, a healer says the ship is shaking when the waves hit them. And when they go up on a wave and then force down like that, because remember they're being towed by the Rhode Island, they think their ship is going to come apart. It is leaking where the hull meets the iron deck or the armor deck, as we would call it. Everything downstairs. Now, I got to tell you, the waves were increasing in such a manner that water started rising in uh, the engine room. And as it rose in the engine room, I have to tell you that was nothing but trouble for the Federals. They uh, actually had to be concerned that um, you know they had to keep the pumps going. And the pumps had to go, because they bring out this one thing called a centrifugal pump. Um, which is made by uh, Adams and is as powerful. George Gear said it could throw a stream of water like the thickness of a man. So they have all these pumps going and they're not working well enough. The water uh, keeps uh, rising and George Gear is there trying to fix them. Everything, all of a sudden, the water rose above the engine platform, and that doused the fires in the boiler. So the ship was filled with a smoky, uh, gaseous fumes. You know, when, when the last stroke of the, you know, when the boiler stops, what's gonna happen? A slide, please. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. They are going to be in huge trouble. You can see the inside of what the monitor looked like. It, this thing, its roof is three times the high as it was. So slide, please. Um, so uh, um, yeah, there she is as she would have left Hampton Roads, although they took the tarp off. Slide, please. That's the Passaic, by the way, who went down south with them. That is Samuel Green, who calls the monitor what? An unseaworthy vessel. Right. And so he's executive officer. Uh, he had survived the storms before. Slide, please. Now, what's going to happen is that's George Gear, who's been talking. He didn't like his Christmas meal. He didn't like anything going on. In fact, he keeps trying to work his um, uh, his his pumps until he said the last stroke of the Worthington pump meant we were doomed right? No pump working, no way of getting out of the ship. Slide, please. And uh, uh, Keeler, this is the Rhode Island, uh, right? Slide, please. I forget about my slides so much. Uh, we're going to talk about what this guy says a lot. That's Frank Butts, who's one of the great recorder, Francis Barrister Butts, just to let it, you know, but he goes by Frank. Slide, please. And um, so, oh yeah, this down in the engine room, just think, so you can see the Worthington pump right there, and you can see the platform the actually engines are sitting on. Now, that's twice as large. Slide, please. Oh, this is going to get great, let me tell you. Now, what is happening is the ship is going in darkness. Bankhead is shouting with his speaking trumpet. He's got the red lantern up. He's firing flares, and the Rhode Island doesn't notice. The ship is wallowing. They break out the hand pumps. Frank Butts says, we did a bucket brigade, right? And he said, I thought it was working fairly well until I didn't get any more buckets. Um, so you can imagine the fear on the ship. William Keeler will say, Everything was enveloped in a thick 
murky darkness, the waves crashing violently across the deck over my head, through the wardroom where the chairs and tables were surging violently from side to side, threatening severe bruises and broken limbs, then up a ladder to the birth deck, across that and up another ladder into the turret, around the guns, over the guns, tackles, shots, sponges. They've all been broken loose. And finally, I was able to get up to the ladder on top of the turret. So they realized everyone's going to have to leave the ship. And it seemed like an eternity. We're now about 10 o'clock, okay? It seems like an eternity. Um, wait a second. We're a little ahead of time, but uh, uh, it was, you know, just about that time. It seemed like an eternity for those Rhode Island boats to come alongside However, just imagine the scene. Now, what Bankhead did was he decided to drop his uh, anchor, which blew out the packing in the anchor well, more water's coming in, but he wanted to stabilize his ship and he ordered uh, John Stocking and James Fenwick to go forward and cut the hawse line with axes. Now, just remember you got 30 foot waves, you got um, anywhere from 40 to 60 knot winds, gust of 60. And there you are, gonna have to go out across a deck covered with water, splashing waves to cut the hawse line. Well, I have to tell you, James Fenwick and John Stocking disappeared. This man, Louis Napoleon Stoddard, will take a rope around him, go along the uh, stays of the deck of the monitor with an ax and he hacks at it. He said he got picked up by a wave, but only by God's grace did he drop down right in spot. He cut the hawse line and this seemed terrible. Um, as they were waiting, Keeler would write, it was a scene well calculated to appall the boldest heart. Mountains of water were rushing across our decks and foaming against our side. The small boats were pitching and tossing about them or crashing against our sides as mere playthings on the billows. The howling of the tempest, the row and dash of the waters, the hoarse order, orders through the speaking trumpet of the officers the response of the men, shouts of encouragement and words of caution, the bubbling cry of some strong swimmer in his agony, the whole scene lit up by ghastly glare of blue lights burning on our concert, formed a panorama of horror which will never efface from my memory. Well, here comes two boats from the Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, what you have to do is you have to go down from the top of the monitor's turret, cross the deck about eight feet, and then the boats can't get right next to the monitor, because guess what? They'll crash against the iron sides and break up. One got cracked getting too close. The Rhode Island iron-hulled vessel can't come back over, because what if the iron-hulled Rhode Island picked up by a wave, dropped on the monitor. What if the monitor was thrown into the side of the Rhode Island? All would have been lost. So you got to realize this harrowing escape everyone has say. George Fredrickson is going to go up to Peter Williams and say, here is my watch. It is yours now because I will not survive the evening. Um, well, um, Keeler leads the first party down into the boats. Uh, actually, when he gets on the deck, a wave hits him and throws him into the water. Uh, um, slide, please. Throws him in the water and then throws him back up. A slide, please. This is the engineer who's trying to keep everything going down below. We'll get a quote from him in just a moment. Oh, there you go. You can see not a happy scene. There's Rhode Island, quarter mile away. There's one of the long boats. Another one has already returned. So you can see how you have to come down that ladder, go across the deck, and jump into that boat. The monitor is going down by the stern slide, please. And 
Um, I'll tell you, when they get uh, to the, uh, let's go next to that. Oh, well, no, let me tell you a story right here. Um, now, up in the turret is Frank Butts. And, um, you know, he is uh, up there helping men get out of the turret and everything, stopped his bailing brigade. However, in the turret with him was the ship's cat. And the cat was howling and screaming. And Butts grabs the cat, throws him down one of the barrels of 11-inch Dahlgren shell guns, and closes the tampion. The sad thing, he could still hear the echo of the cat, just like Edgar Allan Poe's telltale heart. Oh my gosh. Now, just as a side note, we did archaeology. We cleaned out the gun tubes. There was no Lieutenant Whiskers. I was crushed, you know. I had planned these great ceremonies for Lieutenant Whisker. Anyway, so as the ship, the two longboats come alongside, one of them bumps up next to the side of the Rhode Island. Grenville Weeks, the ship's surgeon, naturally will put his arm out to try and brace it. However, his arm is dislocated. Three of his fingers are crushed. You know, he's a right-handed surgeon. He then is... Uh, uh, hauled up. They brought ropes down to haul people up onto the deck of the Rhode Island. He immediately um, has his fingers amputated. Everyone says, oh my gosh, your arm, your arm, your hand. And he goes, look, an arm is worth a life. Oh my gosh. So, um, but actually is going to um, uh, say, uh, okay, we got to, you know, get out of here. And so Bankhead is holding on to the painter as people load the boats. I will tell you, George Gear gets down to jump into the boats with his friend, Daniel Moore. Daniel Moore misses, and all he heard was his gurgle. And George Gear was grabbed by Samuel Dana Green and brought in the boat. William Key, remember I told you? You know, he got picked up thrown in the sea, picked up, thrown back onto the deck, and then he jumps towards the lifeboat. Daggummit, he missed, and he got thrown a line by Lewis Stoddard that was able to save him. As Keeler said, as we crossed in a half-leaking boat, we worried if we would ever live again. Well, I have to tell you, the dangers were not over. Um, you know, the water is coming, as Keeler will say, dangers were not over. We were in a leaky, overloaded boat who, who saw, crossed sides, the water was rushing in streams and had nearly a half mile to row over the storm-tossed sea before we could reach the Rhode Island. And uh, I'll tell you, when all these men make it to the deck, it's like we're saved and the crew members are so kind to everyone. You saw a picture of Edward Waters. They take the chief engineer of the Rhode Island, takes them below, gives them new clothes. Because let me tell you, you know, we found all sorts of shoes in the monitor. Why is that? Because when you're leaving, you're going to have to, you think you're going to have to swim. So you take off your shoes, you take off your pea coats. Actually, you can go to the Mariner's Museum after all this COVID and you'll find a what's called a pilot's coat that we were able to conserve. So, you know, you're getting, Keeler says he's half naked by the time he gets over there. So they're suffering from exposure. It's all terrible. Once they get him here, the one boat's left, Rodney Brown, boatswain's mate. You know, as he left with the last group, there were several people up on the deck. And he shouts to them, I will come back for you. And so um, whether they were too terrified, you know, everyone um, um, kind of, um, you know, it was a scary sight to be in, I have to say. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, as, as they, that boat left, Peter Truscott would say, I saw the darkness and black forms cling to the top of the turret. Now, let me just tell you, 16 people go down with a monitor. We can count certain people that are washed overboard. 
James Fenwick, John Stocking, Daniel Moore, several others. We also know one person, Samuel Augie Lewis, who had joined the Navy in November, right? He's third assistant engineer. He had never been on a ship before. He has never gone to sea before. So he is so seasick down in his bunk that as Frank Butts goes by and says, you got to get off this ship, you know, get up and leave. And uh, Lewis says, I am so sick. I'm dying. I'm going to die anywhere. I'd rather stay here and die. So, you know, uh, I'd say of the 16 that are perished, perhaps about six to eight are still on the boat when it goes down. So um, what's going to happen is Rodney Brown. Is ships leaking, remember? I mean, this guy believes in duty. And so he heads back to get the last people off the monitor. He'll later write, if I had to go up there and get them off the turret, I would have. So the waves, just remember the conditions, you know, uh, 30 to 60 knot winds, huge waves, life is not good. You're in a 18 foot cutter rowing, right? The ship, the Rhode Island is actually being moved away. And Brown keeps seeing that red lantern of the turret. Finally, he goes up a great wave and comes down right where he thought the red lantern was. And all we saw were the eddies, as Frank Butts reported from the deck of the Rhode Island at 1230 in the morning, the monitor is no more. Well, the sinking of the monitor sent shockwaves, of course, to America. How could that little ship that saved the nation be lost as such? And in fact, everyone's panicking. Who survived? Who didn't? The crew was 63 men that took the voyage from Hampton Roads towards uh, Beaufort. I have to say, um, 16 go down. That means Trenchard, people like Rodney Brown, were able to save 47 men in conditions that would give nightmares to any normal person. Now, once they all get back, you know, Rhode Island turns around, takes them back to Hampton Roads. Um, and, and actually, Rodney Brown is missing. You know, he never gets back on the ship. And it's not until the next day he does a jury rig sail, and they're actually rescued by a merchant ship. And um, so that just shows you the horror. Now, once back in Gosport Navy Yard in Hampton Roads, uh, George Gear is going to write his wife. I'm sorry that I have to write you that we lost the monitor. Then he says, but don't worry, I'm safe and well. You know, so, so as a matter of fact, Will, William Keeler wrote his wife several times. The Telegraph has probably informed you before this of the loss of the monitor and also that I am okay. Um, and uh, he will say, and you'll know of my safety. My escape was a very narrow one. I have been through a night of horrors that would have appalled the stoutest heart. Of course, it fell on the shoulders of Commander Bankhead and other officers to write those people that are writing what happened to my brother, what happened to my husband. And Bankhead becomes so ill due to exposure. Most of the writing falls upon Grenville Weeks. And one touching letter, when I was writing the Monitor Boys, I'll tell you, the Mariner's Museum received these 12 letters from the family of Jacob Nicholas. And I had to stop production of my book because I had to add these stories. And the last letter from Jacob, well, relating to Jacob Nicholas, is how Dr. Grenville Weeks replies to his sister. And he says, now remember he lost three fingers and you know, dislocated arm. I am too unwell to dictate more than a short answer to your note. Your brother went down with other brave souls and only a good providence prevented my accompanying him. You have my warm sympathies and the assurance that your brother did his duty well and is gone 
to a brighter war world where storms do not come. And that's the last days of the Monitor. Thank you. Okay, then. The story actually takes two hours to tell, but, you know, I figured. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Fantastic, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we, we certainly thank uh, Mr. Corstein for being here with us. Um, we have quite a few questions in the log um, and we'll get to those in just a moment. If you thought of questions, but you haven't entered them in the chat box yet, if you'd go ahead and um, enter your questions, we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce the owner and manager of Civil War Talk, Mike Kendra, and Mike is going to uh, tell you all about his latest project. Hey, everybody, it's uh, Mike from Civil War Talk, and I wanted to invite you into my shop uh, for today, uh, which is a little bit different, probably not what you're expecting, but uh, yeah, I'm here in my shop today. Uh, I'm actually by my uh, brand new lathe. Uh, if you've been on Civil War Talk, you see I uh, just started making uh, some new pens. And uh, so one of the things I wanted to show you today was some of the stuff I've been working on. Uh, one of the things I'm hoping to accomplish soon uh, is start, start making some uh, Civil War style uh, pens and things like that. And um, so I just wanted to show you what I, one of the things I've been creating, things like this. This is, this is actually, in, uh, I, I don't know how you, you all think about the, the quality of a pen like this, but this is like the very first pen I've made on the lathe. So uh, it's a pretty cool pen, I, I really like it. Now, this was just a practice pen and I know it has flaws. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, I wanted to challenge myself. I started playing around and I started doing things what they call segmenting. So I've uh, added two pieces of wood together uh, and added them together and segmented them together. So, and that's one of the things I wanna try and do with some Civil War style woods. Uh, I've actually uh, already worked on uh, doing some sourcing on some witness tree woods from around the country. Uh, I actually even have some here, like uh, right here, I have some witness tree wood that I just recently uh, uh, acquired. Uh, I have sourced some wood from uh, people who are doing renovations in houses uh, from the 1800s. So, uh, so we should be able to get wood from houses that were actually in uh, battlefield areas. Um, you know, so pulled out of houses that were actually, you know, you can almost say it's witness wood out of houses. Um, we might be able to source some wood from some other unique places. Um, I'd like to be able to tell some stories with the pens um, uh, so that you, you could be able to look at the pen and see there's different kinds of wood there and be able to actually tell a story by saying this piece of wood uh, is, is important because maybe uh, it relates to a person's birthplace and another piece of wood maybe is important because it relates to a specific battle in a certain place. And then maybe another piece of wood is important because it relates to uh, maybe a person's gravesite or something like that. Um, so there might be different interesting things we could do even with a single pen, um, maybe even different than what you've seen done before with, uh, with Civil War wood uh, witness pens, things like that. So, and I, I, have, I have started actually doing uh, exactly like what we're talking about. This is the, the first pen I've done with Gettysburg. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna say this is technically not witness wood. This is just wood from Gettysburg. It's a younger tree, an ash tree that was taken down in Gettysburg. Uh, my parents actually happened to own property in Gettysburg and my mom had an ash tree that was dying from the ash borer bugs. Um, so we took that tree down about a month and a half ago I was surprised it dried out as quickly as it did, but it dried out enough that I was able to turn it and turn it into a pen. And uh, that's a pretty cool pen. It's, uh, it's got some gold flake in it, which doesn't turn up too well on, on camera, but you can see it. But, uh, well, it's interesting stuff. And how the heck are you gonna got, guys gonna go ahead and get a pen like this from me? Well, you need to be a member on Civil War Talk. That's a good way to start. Um, I'll probably be giving these pens out to members uh, staff people, uh, uh, if you're a patron, there's a good opportunity to probably be able to get a pen. Um, so, so Civil War Talk's the place you're going to want to hang out, uh, cause that, that's my place, the place I plan on, on, uh, either giving pens out or making them available through, through members at, at Civil War Talk. 
So if you join CivilWarTalk.com, we have 2 million posts, hundreds of thousands of, of different discussions. I forget the exact numbers, but Laura's got all that information. But uh, yeah, join Civil War Talk. We've got friendly discussions. It's a great community. We'd love to have you if you haven't joined us yet. Uh, it's free. It doesn't cost anything to join. Uh, if you want to donate to go ahead and contribute to our website, we'd appreciate it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it helps to fund the server and keep us up and running. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you joining our community. So, uh, but thanks, John, for, for doing a great discussion with us. We really appreciate having you. It was a good story. I'm glad you were able to go ahead and make it an hour for us. That, that was a good, uh, good edit that you put into it because it didn't sound like an edit, but uh, it's, it was a good, good story. So thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Um, I've got the stats up there. And so if you're not a member of Civil War Talk already, um, like Mike said, we'd encourage everyone to become a member. Um, we have almost 25,000 members and nearly 118. We're, we're knocking the door down on 118,000 different discussion topics. Um, and you can find just about anything, any Civil War topic or related to the Civil War topic that you might want to talk about there. Um, and if you can't find it there, you can always start a new thread and then it'll be there. So hope everybody will become a member. Um, and it's always free to become a member. So uh, go to civilwartalk.com and become a member. Uh, Mr. Corstein, we sure appreciate your presentation and we are gonna get to those questions if it's all right with you. you if you can unmute, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the questions and we will be ready to get to those. The first question is from um, Bobby and he would like to know of all of the artistic uh, renderings you've seen of the sinking of the monitor, which one would you say is the most accurate? Oh, you're gonna have to unmute. They all have flaws and um, like my favorite is actually the one with the boat alongside and with the monitor going down by the stern, but it has the awning up and they would not have had the awning up if they were gonna go to sea. Um, uh, there's some that, um, uh, there are a couple of more modern ones. I think Tom Freeman did one that's nice, um, but they all make minor errors, you know, and uh, like one beautiful one has red lights coming off of the um, uh, Rhode Island, but we know they were blue lights and uh, the uh, star shells were white or blue or red. And uh, they, uh, so, you know, not everyone understands the uh, uh, details that go into, and I, I worked with uh, several artists for the Monitor Center on, you know, um, a very nice artist out of the Hudson really River Valley School, and I'll think of his name sometime soon, uh, but uh, he was very precise, but he went through an editing process, and so you got to have those facts, and uh, if you don't have them, it's just like, where did they hang the Red Lantern from, you know? And that's a big question, Based on archaeological evidence, they hung it from a stanchion at the top of the turret. So, because no one could go out to the front. One person has the lantern out at the bow of the ship, and I wouldn't have gone out there to take any lantern out. I don't know about you. Maybe to chop the hawse line, but, uh, you know, um, yeah. So, um, I, I like several. Uh, I have one that was done by Alonzo Chapel, uh, Chappell, excuse me. And he um, really got it great. Now, when I was younger, I used to buy all the Civil War stuff and, you know, my family humored me. And uh, uh, so I have all sorts of, you know, unusual paintings and stuff. But there's this one by Alonzo Chapel that like blew me away. And I kept telling everyone when I was a teenager, this proved that God was on the side of the Confederacy. And I was like, shut up you, you know, um, but we know that God was not on anybody's side, and actually it's sad that the war even happened, but uh, I've changed my way since I became a professional historian, let's just put it that way, <laughs> so uh, 
anyway, but that was that that is an excellent view. Um, so um, uh, you can go online and see different images that have been done. Uh, if you want to buy modern print, Tom uh, Chappelle, there's a great prints done in Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's that are somewhat accurate. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, they're out there. You can uh, get Alonzo Chappelle. He actually did the painting and then he did all these prints. So, you know, I have the line and original line engraving. So, uh, you know, which, you know. <laughs> Have you ever done any painting yourself? I bet you could. Uh, no, I'm I'm a writer, not a painter. You know, there's some things you do, some things you don't. Um, and I just can't think uh, of anybody else who would be who would have more information to do. And well, I, I I could I could draw one and I can show you you know all this stuff, but uh, someone else is going to have to make it into something visually enjoying. <laughs> I understand. Me too. I'm not much of an artist either. Um, Richard would like to know which of your books and how much coverage of Catesby app, Roger Jones, and which book would that be in? Oh my gosh, that would be in my book called CSS Virginia. And the CSS Virginia is almost 600 pages. Um, it tells the narrative of the life of the Virginia, what it did, how it was built, what happened to it. But I also tell the story, just like I did the Monitor Boys, from the viewpoint of the crew members. So I actually, um, well, Ted Savis told, told me that the book was two in one. You know, one was a great narrative, and then one was all this research I did. I did a bio of every crew member. Um, so I have all sorts of information about Catesby app Roger Jones um, in there. I have, I think, nine appendices uh, that, you know, tell all this and that. So it's, uh, it was, uh, that was a long research project because, you know, um, I'd already been researching the Monitor Boys for the Mariners Museum. And so I did a bio of every one of them. However, um, you know, when it came to the Virginia, I said, wow, there are, you know, 447 people. I can do this. The first 150 were like, ah, ha, ha, isn't this fun? And all the officers, ah, ha, ha, isn't this fun? Well, when you get to around 390, you got problems, you know, thanks to Confederate records. Many of the crew members were from infantry units. Um, and there's no further record about other than where they came from no pension records and things like that. So uh, that made it a little difficult. So I think uh, all I could say was this guy came from here and gosh knows where he went after he was on the Virginia. And some of them, you know, like they get paid, um, they got paid a bonus for actually being on the Virginia, a $50. Um, and then they got, you know, ration money and clothing allowances. And then all of a sudden it stops. You know, like, where did this guy go? Well, I deserted and moved to Texas. You know, I don't know. Um, uh, so, but uh, yeah, it's, it's um, the Monitor Boys is just like the Virginia, except the Virginia was a much bigger story. And uh, I dealt with more technology and Catesby app Roger Jones is in there big time. Whoever wants to know. Okay. And, uh, and the, the name of the book is CSS uh, CSS Virginia, Virginia Sink Before Surrender. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, it's on Amazon, but you can also get it at the Mariners Museum just by going to their website. Okay, um, and we're going to see it in just a minute in our book oh, promo boy. section. So um, uh, Larry would like to know what improvements were made on the monitors throughout the war. Okay, so improvement number one uh, was after the battle, when the shell hit the pilot house, it blew some of the iron logs off. So Albin Steimers goes out and makes it into a pyramid. In other words, he's got a sloped side to it. So some pictures you see of the monitor, even that of the sinking, they have a little square one. Well, no, it's got to be the sloped view that, um, and that was done by Albin Steimers. Nothing else is done. That thing is black. And then during the summer, they paint it light gray. Um, then it goes up to the Washington Navy Yard. 
And so many of the plates were repaired that had been rutted by shot from Drees Bluff or the Virginia. Uh, then uh, she also got new blowers, a new blower system that Erickson had developed that actually had fans that sucked air out of through the turret and into tubes throughout the ship. So William Keeler said that was a huge, huge improvement. Uh, they scraped the bottom. They um, um, did some other minor repairs, but the engine, the boilers were shot, you know, so they had to be removed and replaced. The engine needed to be uh, reworked because it had been constantly used from uh, January through October of 1862. So they were worn out, you know, and uh, especially they were a new style of engine, a side lever trunk engine, which uh, Erickson invented. And so it was very small, so it could fit within the confines of the monitor. But it did not produce as much power. Um, and so you'll really see that some of the improvements made to the monitor are improvements that are gonna be made to the Passaic class. No change to the pilot house, but there are changes to the fresh air and everything that goes through the ship. Okay. Okay. Um, and David would like to know how much freeboard did the monitor have loaded as she was that night? 18 inches. Okay. And I mean 18 inches. <laughs> yeah. Just 18 inches. No, no, no. I'd, I'd go on another ship. I'd have been on the Rhode Island, you know. Maybe I'd just be at a base being quartermaster. I don't know. <laughs> you know. And uh, let's see, Tina would like to know why did they not use breech buoys? I don't know what that is, but. Uh, they hadn't really developed them. There were none on the, uh, that's really a post-Civil War development, believe it or not. Um, so the monitors had two cutters but they stored them on the Rhode Island because they didn't want to lose them at sea. <laughs> so they had no way of getting off. They had, um, um, they developed a couple of life-saving techniques, but not uh, by uh, in regular use by the Civil War. It's really um, the uh, Coast Guard station, well, they called um, life-saving stations that really develop all sorts of rescue at sea type of tools. Um, and this is uh, Richard, a different Richard, and he said, you're a great storyteller, first of all, but he would like to know, was no one posted topside on the monitor to keep watch? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, there would always be, when you're at sea, someone posted at top uh, or on the top of the turret. Bankhead spent a great deal of time up there. He'd go down into the turret so he could send orders to the engine room, check on this, check on that. Um, but you did keep uh, people up on, uh, um, up on the deck, especially on watch. In fact, it was a very dangerous position. Uh, if you, you know, you read my book, The Monitor Boys, you know, there they are in the James River. Um, Confederates like to do what? Well, we're going to shoot at that boat. We hate it, you know, Yankees. And, and so what did they do? William Keeler goes to John Pine Bankhead, said we need to put up a sniper shield on top of the turret. And it was going to be one inch boilerplate, which, you know, would stop most shots uh, from far away. So that, you know, you're only exposing yourself like this. Otherwise, when you got on top of the turret, you were, you were exposed and uh, as they learned at Drury's Bluff. Um, and so I would have to say uh, uh, they do, there's records by Keeler saying they did it. There's record by Bankhead said is a great idea, but I have to tell you, there's no archeological evidence that had already been installed. We see a lugs on the turret that were extra to the stanchion ones. So there was a way to put it on, but not, we have no clue why Bankhead and Keeler would say it was there and it 
there's no evidence of it, other than it rushing away and just disappeared. Most of the images of the scenes will not show that it's called a breastwork. Um, so, but later monitors surely had them um, when operating in certain uh, uh, conditions, like going up the Stona River or, you know, the big Okachee. I have a program I'm doing for the Mariners Museum next Friday at noon about Worden and the Montauk, which is really, you know, uh, he's going to destroy the CSS Nashville and prove why monitors were not good to attack forts. Um, but I'll and, share that one. I'll share that one on Civil War Talk. We should, okay. when you were with us last time, we shared the program that you were doing the next Friday. So we'll share it on the site. Um, I'll send you my, I don't have your email address, but you can send it to me if you wish. Okay, we will. Okay. Um, David said, what a great presentation. He extends the traditional Navy signal BZ for a job well done. I guess you know what that means. Yes. Huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. Okay, here's our next question. How many ironclads survived the war? Hmm. Um, um, well, Confederates put 21 in the water. They burned several at the stocks, like Tennessee One in Memphis, um, the Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, the Atlanta was captured. The uh, Albemarle was destroyed. The Raleigh ran aground and broke its back. With Union ships, they, they, uh, um, they can build a lot of ironclads. So I'd have to sit down and count. You know, the Cairo went down. Um, the, uh, uh, of course, the Patapsico, um, the Weehawken, uh, the Monitor. Um, several of our, our ships, especially Conoclus class, uh, were sold to Peru and uh, other South American nations. Actually, the Federals captured the Atlanta, sold it to Haiti. It was renamed the Triumph, and it sank en route to Haiti in a storm off Cape Hatteras. So it's out there somewhere, and it became a Union ship once they captured it. And there's a lot of great photographs just to see the, how they sloped the armor. So anyway, the Peruvians, the Chile, Chileans, the Bolivians all fought a war a series of war known as the Guano Wars or War of the Pacific. They're fighting over those islands where all those bats live to get that guana. And that was a big deal, a post-Civil War era. So Matthew Gall, uh, yeah, there's some, I was surprised. I was up in uh, Montreal giving a lecture and I go down to this, uh, no, I was in, um, where was I? Yes, I was in Quebec. And I go down to the Maritime Museum, and there's a statue of Matthew Gall, who dies defending the Huscar, which is a case-mated, English-made ironclad, which actually they saved. And it's, if you want to go down to Chile, I've been there, um, and I've been to where every ironclad still exists. So, you know, I'm kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. I had no idea that the Atlanta was so... Yeah. That's great. Yeah, um, that they they sold the Sputin Devil and uh, the Onondaga to France, uh, you know. And yet we still had them in commission. The last one struck from the Navy list was in 1937, the Amphrodite. Let's oh, just well. go put that in your pipe and smoke it, I guess. There you go. I think that must answer Richard's question. And that was the last question that we have. I, but I think that probably... What I'm, I'm going to do, because... I will make an accurate listing. Okay. And write it in a blog. Uh, that would be great. The Mariners Museum, or if you what give a great me, topic. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to have to actually go through um, some big books and the official records, which I have right over there. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of crazy, but you know, that'd be a great topic, right, for a blog post. I think. Oh, yeah, I think what happened to the ironclads. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. Torpedoes 
and Mother Nature sank uh, more ships than in any other way for the Union. And um, so uh, that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And uh, I look forward to having another opportunity to be on Civil War Talks with y'all. Uh, it's a pleasure to share we what I know wait. and don't know with you all. Well, we can't wait to have you back. And um, we uh, would like to thank you very much for being here with us again for your encore presentation. We enjoyed it very much and um, always appreciate when you join us. Um, just a reminder to all of our guests tonight that the presenters do these programs for us uh, grotto and gratis and um, they would appreciate it if you would uh, purchase their books. And the Monitor Boys, the crew of the Union's First Ironclad, um, or any of the other great books, uh, right, Mr. Forstein, they can buy any of them. Uh, and when purchasing the books, Mr. Forstein would appreciate it if you would kindly order them through the Mariner's Museum and Park Gifts Shop because he can sign them if you do so, um, rather than if you just purchase them off of Amazon where you can't get a signed copy. If you'll purchase them through the gift shop at the Mariner's Museum, um, they can let him know that you did that. Uh, just put a note with your order that you would like it to be signed and they will have, he, next time he's in, he will sign the book for you. Um, and I've then, already got some signed, but if you want it personalized, I have to go by there to do certain things uh, at least once a week nowadays. And uh, someone asked, I see in the chat box um, about uh, David Dixon Porter's book. If you oh, like that. David Dixon Porter, it's a great book, okay? Because like he was better than Farragut, uh, but uh, it's a fairly accurate telling of the stories. Just David Dixon Porter is the real naval hero of the Civil War. So, you know, uh, uh, but uh, I have a copy somewhere around here, um, but uh, I think I read it 30 years ago and hardly ever use it, you know? Uh, so but that's just the way it goes. I use my official records almost every day. <laughs> so. I must have missed that question. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it was in the chat box and somehow I just clicked it. Good. That's where um, I, that I saw sometimes, some of these questions. Yeah, sometimes I scroll yeah. past them. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah. we encourage you to order a book from the Mariner's Museum. And like Mr. Forstein said, he'll, he has copies there that are signed or if you'd like it personalized, he'll do that for you the next time that he goes. Um, it is the winner of the 2012 Henry Adams Prize for Excellence in Historical Literature. Um, as mentioned in the intro, Mr. Forstein has written 20 books now, right? Yeah, we, we said 19, but it's actually 20 now. And here are a few of the ones that we discussed or that we mentioned, um, the CSS Virginia Sink Before Surrender that Richard asked about that had um, the uh, bios of the yeah. crew members. Um, and uh, the CSS Virginia, I can personally recommend that, which recounts the compelling story of the Ironclad Underdog. It's a fantastic book and includes those biographies of the crew members and the chronology of the um, Virginia, which is very interesting. Um, and Mr. Forstein's titles aren't limited to the Naval War, the Civil War on the Vir Virginia Peninsula, and Yorktown Civil War Siege Drums along the Warwick, um, which is my favorite. So go ahead and order them all. And uh, just go to shopmarinermuseum.org and you can order all of them and have them personalized there. Um, if you can't find them at the Mariner Museum or they happen to be out of stock, you can also purchase them on uh, Amazon. And Mr. Forstein has been kind enough to provide his email address. So if there's a question that you have um, that we didn't get to or that I scrolled through that I didn't mean to. Sorry about that. But if I missed your question um, or if you think of another question, um, his email address is here um, and you can find the books that you aren't able to get through the Mariner Museum from Amazon. We'll be taking a break next week for, uh, to celebrate the new year, but be sure to join us on January 13th when our guest will be Lance Hertigan on the Iron Brigade and Civil War and memory. Lance is an engaging speaker and his presentations are always super interesting. Um, if you haven't heard him before, I don't think you'll be disappointed. That's on Wednesday, January 13th. So I encourage you to join us then. Um, of course, the rest of our schedule is here on January 20th. You won't want to miss Matt Atkinson, Gettysburg National Military Park Ranger. 
His topic will be General Lee. On January 27th, Michael Hardy will be making his encore presentation and his topic will be North Carolina Remembers Gettysburg. Um, I think the last time he was with us, he did um, the Branch Lane Brigade and this time it's specifically uh, North Carolina units at Gettysburg. Um, on February 3rd, Darren Whipperman, first for the Union Life and Death in the Civil War Army Corps, Antietam to Gettysburg. February 10th, Derek Maxfield, Hellmire. I'm looking forward to that one. The Union's most infamous Civil War prison camp. And the name of the book is Hellmire, but the, of course the prison camp's called Elmira. Uh, February 17th is open. So if anybody, um, Mr. Forstein, if you want I'll do that. Um, if you want to snag that date, remember what, we day, what day is that on? It's on a Wednesday. Okay, I can do that. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, um, I'm uh, doing a lot of, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll, I don't know if I'll have time to feel with how many ironclads sunk, but. Uh, okay, well, that's okay. Do you have any love stories about uh, on the ship? <laughs> yeah, because it's. Well, I hate to tell you. Uh, uh, I sadly uh, read uh, Franklin Buchanan's report on the superannuated officers uh, that were still in the U.S. Navy in 1857, and he called one man, uh, Victor Randolph, um, that his real complaint about him was that he was too fond of cabin boys, so I don't think we want those types of stories. Even though it is Valentine's Day, we'll skip that yeah, one. No, no, we're not, you know, uh, I mean, there's some love stories between people on a ship and like, I mean, uh, William Keeler tell, uh, George Gear when he writes home, he says, make sure you brush your teeth, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know it's pretty funny. No, uh, but I'll, I'll think of something and I guess I'll send it to y'all. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll, I, I could do the 17th. That'd be great. So on February seventeenth, it's not on your, it's not on your screen here, but uh, John Corstein will be back uh, for his encore encore performance, <laughs> and we look forward to that. Um, on February twenty fourth, it's a new kind of a program. Um, David Vasquez will be presenting original research um, on equine rider psychology and how it explains the disaster at Queenland. Uh, on March third, Wade, Wade Sokolowski. Um, on his brand new book, To Prepare for Sherman, Sherman's Coming, The Battle of Wise's Fort, March 18th and March 1865. And Wade Sokolowski will be the kickoff of the new, um, he'll be the first of Savas authors that's coming in to promote their spring um, books. So don't miss that because if you, if you want to see what's coming from Savas, you'll uh, Savas Beatty Publishers, you'll want to join us to, um, on March 3rd. Uh, so don't forget, thanks everybody for being with us tonight. Mr. Corstein, thank you so much. It was thank fantastic you. as usual. What a great story. And our uh, next Civil War Talk presentation will be Wednesday, January 13th at 8.30 and features Lance Hurrigan. And we wish you all a happy new year. Thanks for joining us tonight. And we'll see you on Wednesday, January 13th at 8.30. Thank Good you. Night. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you much. Happy Thank New you. Year. Thank you so much, Mr. Corstein. That was fabulous.